happy, happy, happy Monday, everybody. Hope everyone's good. Hope you've had a wonderful week. It is six o'clock. It is Monday. It is the Monday snack. Got a great show today. Got a really, really cool show today. Um, and I keep forgetting to say this because I know some people watch, watch like now, and some people watch later on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, please do remember to like and to subscribe if you like. It helps me with the whole algorithm. Show me some love, please. That'd be really, really cool. Right, um, this is show number 17. Show number 17, and I've, it's taken this long, right? No, no, it actually hasn't taken this long, but it's kind of been brought home to me. Just, I feel very fortunate to be around sort of, you know, a multitude of really talented folk, really talented, really great people, and this week is no different. What normally happens, what normally happens is I struggle. I struggle because I just want to keep talking. So I end up doing the interview. It takes, you know, hours, just chatting for ages. And then it becomes really, really hard to um, edit the conversation down. That's what happened this week. It was really, really hard because my guest, my guest is the truly wonderful the truly amazing, truly gifted Yolanda Charles, bass player, bass player to the stars, bass player to the stars. Um, enough yakking, enough yakking. Um, I really hope I was able to edit this well enough so you really get a flavour for all of the stuff Yolanda had to say because it was a great, enlightening conversation. Enough of me, let's get to it. Here we go. Okay, people, today is an extremely special show. An extremely special show because I have I have with me a bass playing giant. I have a phenomenal musician. A phenomenal, absolutely incredible musician. She is the wonderful, wonderful Yolanda Charles. Yolanda, what's going on? How are you? Hey, Andrew. I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for having me here. I am so grateful that you have blessed me with your presence. It's so cool. <laughs> it's so, so cool. Right. So um, I, was thinking, I was thinking about how to do this. Right. And with you, it's more it's, it's more a case of not who you've worked with. Right. But who you haven't. <laughs> so it made it very tricky for my usual silliness. It's normally 40 minutes of silliness. We were speaking before, you haven't watched any of these, which is really, really funny. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. Um, no, I do not. <laughs> but for um, for those people watching who may not um, be aware of your awesomeness, you've worked with, you've worked with everyone, man. You've worked with Squeeze, with Hans Zimmer, with Paul Weller, Eric Clapton, Alison Moye, Van Morrison McJagger, Jimmy Somerville, you've worked, and that's only, I only got a part with, you know, I kind of went online, This was only, I was only a little way down the list, man. It just kept going. The list kept going. So you've, you've done a lot of stuff, man. You've done a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm, have, yes. um, obviously, the last, the last sort of 12 to 14 months have been quite challenging for the world at large. But you've had some highlights, man. You, you've got an MBE, man. You've got an MBE, <laughs> which is very cool, right? Yeah, yeah. And even better than that, you got the gig with Sting. Oh my day, you got the gig with Sting. Now, Dude. right? Yes. Landing the gig with Sting. Mm -hmm. I find the uh, numerous musicians I speak to, right? That is the gig. Everyone says, What's the gig you, you'd want to do? If you think of any gig you'd want to do, what would be the one? You... Everyone says, or so many people say, Sting. Mm -hmm. And you're actually doing it. That's amazing. Yeah. When I saw that, I was excited. I was excited. I was probably more excited <laughs> than you. <laughs> no, no, no. You couldn't have been more excited. Than oh, me, man. Oh, man. It's really, 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 really cool. So in amongst the madness, there's been some really bright sparks in the last 12 months for you. Um, so, a bit of history. We met a really, really long time ago. Really long time ago. And I think mm -hmm. the first time I met you was at a jazz cafe. You were playing with either, I can't remember, it's either um, Raw Style or Urban Species. It's one of the two, right? Yeah. yeah, um, been, yeah. Back then. But we never actually played together until 2019. Mm. And we know what was really weird about that. It immediately, for me, felt comfortable. It's like yes. a fine pair of slippers. Like, you know, you put on, <laughs> you know, you've got a lovely pair of slippers or a nice little hoodie. You, you, oh, yeah. you know, you sit up in front of the telly, you're warm, you're cuddly. It's all really yes. happening. You know, that's how yes. it felt. It just, it just really yes. worked. And it's, mm. it's something I always love when I get the chance to work with a great bass player. Um, that immediately it felt really comfortable. 
Um, it was an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. I was... And for me. It was an absolute honour, absolute honour, right? Then, on the basis of this, I do ramble for a bit and then we get into your questions, right? But cool. then, um, after that show, you, you came over and you, you played on the track on my new record, right? Yes, that was exciting. That was good. That wasn't easy either. That wasn't easy. Now, you said it wasn't easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. And this is what leads to my first question, right? It was amazing simply because it was yourself, myself and Steve Turner, right? Mm. And it was almost like it was, I think I just written it that morning. You didn't get it beforehand, did you? I think you arrived yeah. and, it, and it just, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, it materialised, yeah. I'm really sorry. Everyone's kind of been <laughs> <laughs> fallen victim to my, yes. to my mode of writing. So you've turned up. Impressive. You've turned up and you've just been faced with this thing, right? Uh, Steve is kind of used to it, right? But um, you, you've you just been faced with this thing and the way that the pocket just happened, right? And there were tricky bits of that tune, but the, mm. the way that it always, it all kind of slid together, um, there I can think of th three or four bass players I've worked with who dragged me along. <laughs> <laughs> Time and pocket-wise, you're one of them. Right, there are three or four that I work with, and when when you when you guys play, I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, this is it, this this is where it's at. That yeah. was one of those times, and for nice. for a, for a, a relatively complex piece of music, not all the way through, but there were complex bits, for it to feel that great. You left, you and Steve left. I you know, I went back, opened up Pro Tools, pressed play, and went, oh my days, this sounds great. <laughs> so what ended up in the album was basically mm -hmm. the last take. Ah, it okay. was basically the, the last time we played it. Mm -hmm. That more or less ended up being the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So this is my question. It's taken a long time. It's taken me five minutes to get here. That's really bad. <laughs> but right? um, I want to zone in, and this is going to be hard with the expanse of your career. I want to zone in on how over the years you honed that pocket, that sense of time, that sense of flamboyance you have. You kind of go off piste, right? And it all feels <laughs> like it belongs. It's not safe. You just go for stuff yeah. and it's like, actually, yeah. it seems like it always should have been there. So I want to know mm -hmm. how you, and I'm going to keep pressing you in terms of what experiences kind of form that. So where did that pocket, that accuracy, that time, where did it come from? I think that the study of it started quite early in my sort of session career. But realistically, um, a certain amount of it has to have been formulated from listening experience as a child. You know, when you grow up with music, the music that you listen to informs your taste and it informs mm -hmm. your how you hear music, really. So if you hear music from a young child growing up in utero, you know, you're literally in your mum's womb <laughs> and you're hearing heavy reggae and soca and calypso. Right. And, okay. and uh, my mum liked um, some kind of more European and British I say European because I'm talking about ABBA here right now. Right, okay, okay. <laughs> so there's some there's some stuff she liked that was like that, but most of it was all um, black origin music, pretty much. And the reggae and Caribbean, because my parents are from Caribbean, Grenada and Montserrat. And um, I think that, that that's major in my sense of timing, uh, my sense of feel. Mm. But as a session musician, I just walked into my first sort of proper session um, which was after the Jimmy Somerville thing was that was a, just a short short spurt, but the Paul Weller was the kind of bigger one, right. and that was a kicking. <clears throat> I received a bit of a kicking really? from Paul, yeah, musically, yeah, because okay. I came into the session uh, having come from Urban Species, Raw Stylist bands like that, and I played the way I played. So I naturally had good feel because I think, like I said, my, my formula, formulating years, but the um, my kind of musicianship wasn't developed, you know. I just played the way I played. I was just lucky enough to have had this influence from my parents. So I came now into Paul's gig and wasn't really ready for it because I'd come from a soul funk background and hadn't listened to any real, really got into any British pop and rock Um a guy I was dating at the time actually introduced me to Led Zeppelin uh, and those kind of bands. And um, yeah, it was uh, Zappa was a big influence. And right. I got to hear a lot more Pat Metheny, other kind of music. But my main upbringing was in the soul funk stuff. And certainly playing wise, it was soul and funk. And um, I went into Paul's gig not knowing anything about, you know, 
Free or, or even the Beatles and all right. those bands. I didn't right, listen okay. to it. I just didn't have to. At my house, it wasn't on the record player. And, mm. uh, you know, I'd be listening out for, with on the pirate radio stations with my cassette to press record and teeth the tunes off the, off the radio. Like we all did, right? To buy records. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So I went into first day rehearsal and I, I, I played the way I played and it wasn't quite right. So I had to take it home and work on it. And that's where, when I first started fine tuning my ear to nuance. And this nuance that's given me my ability to shift my pocket and to adopt and adapt to different styles um, when I need to. And how much, so it's interesting you say that, right? Because obviously a lot of the stuff you've gone on to do has kind of been on the rock side of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but how much of, that shifting and that that sort of adjusting your ear as you as you put it um how deliberate was it i, want, I guess i'm trying to ask you know did you did you sort of go away and think right i have to listen to this album this album this album and was it listening or was it then sitting down thinking right i need to sort of get my my hands around this particular album or this particular tune how did you approach how did you approach that well i've never been um a transcriber of anybody's bass style. So I didn't learn Jacko. I didn't learn, I knew it because I listened to it, but I didn't know it, right? So when I came into the Paul Weller situation, I listened to his album and that we were supposed to do for rehearsal. And so I knew it to a certain degree and I'd learned the notes, of course. Right. right? But I didn't know it right. here because it wasn't something I'd let it seep into my bones. I didn't understand that you had to do that then or how, how it can be really beneficial to do that. So for me, it was a case of really artificially learning how to do this. So it wasn't a just, um, when I say artificially, I'd say um, deliberately and technically learning how to play the music, which was where are the notes being played on the bass neck? That gives the notes different sound. It's the difference between playing um, a, a G low down the neck or a G in the same register higher up the neck. It takes a physical movement, you know, okay. and that physical movement creates a particular sound. It's not just the tone of the note. It's how you got there. I kind of listened in microscopically almost right. to um, work out what was making the bass line work. And I did that on that particular gig and that really helped me in those rehearsals because Paul was happier after I made those changes. Yeah. So yeah. I feel that that was a really important thing to have done. And then I didn't stop doing that. Sometimes you think you know it. As soon as I start to think I know it, I stop looking at this, mm. which is dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be lovely. Keep reading it really. Lovely. Yeah. Oh, quite nice, lovely. Safe one. So this, this one, do you want to... I might go in and repair a few of those runs for you so you've got some more to do. Yeah, well, listen, if you want. I think so. But in this one you want to do... Maybe sort of less syncopated, maybe in sort of longer notes and stuff like that. No, is that what you're doing? Oh, you're same vibe. Same vibe, okay. same vibe. Okay. Yeah, that, that, was, that was chilled enough. Wasn't it, was quite, it was quite yeah, chilled. Yeah, it was nice, yeah. yeah. To keep but it, still with a few little... Yeah. Some, oh, some really... Lovely, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So happening. Oh my day, she's happening, she's happening, she's happening. Cool. I'm gonna say hi to some folks. Boy, you know what? I'm gonna hi to some folks because man, folks are turning out because 
Good landed in the house. Here we go. Right, so with Maxine to Daniel to Sam to Stefan to Steve Turner, the man on keys in that clip. To Adam, to Jonathan, to Martin, to Matty, to Johnny, to Mick, to Anita. Anita, Anita, what's for dinner? Actually, you wrote down what's for dinner. Sorry, folks, anyone that's not a regular, right? Anita always lets us know what she's eating for dinner. So today on the menu is lentil soup with crunchy bread and mixed salad. Oh, man, Anita, this week you've stepped up. you stepped up. That sounds happening. That's happening. Cool. Where was I? Anita. And to Dawn, and to Laura, and to Glenn, and to John. I see Jazzy Ron has just joined the party. Um, and Adam Kovach as well. Absolute G. Absolute G. Right. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Yeah, so um, in this next bit of our conversation, right, um, what did we talk about? We talked about Yolanda's distinct style. She's got there's a Yolanda Charles thing going on, right? So we talked about her style and also we had a chat about what happens when things don't go quite as well as you want them to. The thing is, right, the things I've heard you on, like, I remember, I remember you playing with Robbie, um, it was like, it was still the Yolanda Charles sound. But like you said, it, it from gig to gig, it morphed into what the gig required, but still the Yolanda Charles sound. <laughs> it's quite interesting. How do you do that thing where you're playing what's appropriate, not just appropriate, but you're you're putting your stamp on something, but it fits. Did you did you come up with a did you come up with a, a method for doing that, or was it did it just naturally kind of just evolve that way? I was a bass player who was is a fan of music first and foremost so i was never a bass player's bass player as in i would never just listen to bass as a as a separate thing it's yeah. just that the bass spoke to me in with but always within a musical context All right yeah so i never really thought about bass as a separate thing it was always part of music so i didn't know i only heard jacko for the first time in 87 I think that was the year he passed away. And I didn't know anything about jazz before that, only sort of standards and, you know, um, Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra and stuff like that. But I didn't, and big band, but I didn't know about all the fusion and all of that that was going on. Didn't know a thing about it until I went to Sixth Form Centre at 17. And um, so when it came to bass, I'm always thinking about bass in context of songs or music, never as a separate thing. So I never learnt any bass player's stuff. I never transcribed any bass player's music. I never transcribed bass lines. If I could play a bass line, it's because a bass line is a melody. Right. And that's the one I was hearing because I'm a natural bass player. But I would hear the bass lines as melodies. So I would just be singing the bass lines in my head or playing them on the bass. Or guitar, I used to play bass lines on guitar. So I think in some ways, right, because I didn't have a lot of influence from a specific uh, bass player, because I never thought of myself as solely bass. It was always bass context music. That's the bass context music always. Um, I don't sound like anyone else because I didn't learn anyone else's style, you know, apart from one person. Who was that? Well, when I was quite young still, so early days of playing bass, um, I started listening to Herbie Hancock Headhunters. So Paul right. Jackson's probably my biggest right. influence in terms of okay. my stylistically, I think he's right. the biggest influence in my playing. Okay. It's quite funny. You, you're the second or third person, I know definitely the second person I've interviewed, bass player I've interviewed, that said the bass spoke to me. Actually, in those, actually that exact phrase. Yeah. It must be something about the bass. Bass is, bass is, um, there's something about the frequencies or something. I don't know, man. It's just like, and my mum used to say that too. She, she said that the bass is the thing that would always get her. It should cool. always, it would hit her somewhere. Primordial, you know, like in her gut. And um, I must have picked that up from her because I was always checking out music, but only singing the bass lines. 
and only right. really hooking into the bass line. I will never hook into the melody. I never. I would know some melodies. Even now, I don't really listen to lyrics that much. I write them right. <laughs> for my own stuff. <laughs> I don't necessarily la like lock into uh, lyrics um, or even melody that much. I'm definitely a rhythm section person. It's always drums, always bass, always. You've obviously been insanely successful, right? Um, but do you have an anecdote? Um, of where things didn't go well. Most of my guests sort of have a massive horror story, like a serious horror story. <laughs> everyone's got one. Yeah, everyone's got one. Everyone's got one. Like, it, it, has it ever been a vibe where you've gone in a situation it's like, oh man, this, this didn't go well? Or has it been like a pristine procession? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can say it's been, if it's been pristine, it's been pristine, man. Don't, don't you know? It hasn't, no. No, far from it, man. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh my God. Listen, I'm just trying to figure out which to cherry pick for you right now. <laughs> it's no, it's no names, man. It's no names. We, we, it's always hypothetical. Okay, hypothetical let's with. do, let's do a no names one then. Okay, right. a no names one is after I finished this tour. Yeah. I didn't pick up my bass for about a year. Didn't touch it. Wow. I was going to quit. That was the thing. Yeah. Based on so so what what was this Being is good to bullied. this is good to know. You're right. Yeah, I was feeling bullied. I was I was traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> I was young, really young. And right. um, how young were you then? How young, roughly? Well, I'm going to give it away if I say my age. No, no, I mean, it was saying... in my twenties. Right. Okay. Early days. Early days. So I was, I was in a situation where I just thought, well, if this is a successful moment, and this is what's gonna, this is what success is. I don't think I want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So I had to take some time. And actually, yeah. I have to say that one of the things that I realise now that's done me the best kind of self-advice, self kind of like reflection stuff has been to wait, always wait, take your time, be patient, let the dust settle. Because when you're feeling, you know, sort of triggered in some way or, you know, feeling dis miserable or, or not knowing what to do about something or whatever if you just wait and don't push it look away look away from it that's why i put my base down because i was right. like if i keep pushing forward with this right now the way i feel uninspired and all the rest of it i won't want to play so i just left it until i missed it it took me about a year right so would you say that that situation was just a negative situation in terms of the way you were treated would you say it was a situation you were ready for when you went into it, musically? It's, it's, it was definitely nothing musical. It was definitely to do with character and personality. Personal. Right, okay. And it was that I needed to grow a little bit more, needed to grow up a bit more and to be stronger. Right. And, you know, a lot of what is in the mix of that is being female, right? Mm. And people might say, oh, it must be really difficult for you being female um, in the industry. And you don't get a pass for being a female in the music business as an instrumentalist. Right. Um, you can have high, high, harder blocks to climb Yeah. as a female. Um, but every musician, male and otherwise, tell me of the same instances where they've just had horrible moments to do with their ego, being dissed, being out mm. of their depth. So it yeah. isn't just unique to women, this. Yeah. But I have to say... Um, in terms of sensitivity and being female in that environment, in the music business, I had to develop such a tough skin. You have to do that and self-soothe. Don't ask for a pass. Don't ask for any special allowances or treatment because you can't expect it and it doesn't come. It's funny to talk about the bullying thing. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of things over the years where right. you're on the road and you're thinking, mm -hmm. hold on a second. Mm. This is meant to be the most enjoyable part of my life. I'm doing the thing I've dreamed of doing all this time. I'm, I'm traveling the world. I'm mm. playing music. This is great. Why mm. on earth do I feel like, you know, someone's messed with my head, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's really, really interesting, right? That as musicians, we love what we do. We love what we do. It's the best job in the world. But it's not always plain sailing. But you know what? The rough times make the, make the great times amazing. Amazing. I'm gonna hi to I'm gonna say hi to a few more folks. Um um Michael to Michael to John Fisher. You know what? I'm in trouble again. I'm in trouble again because I didn't say Mrs. S. Mrs. S is in the house. 
Mrs. S is in the house. And her mum, mother-in-law, is also in the house. Very cool. Yeah. It's been a while. Mum, it's been a while. Rum cake. It's been a while. I think I'm due a rum cake. Anyway, Anita, um, I was going to ask, right? Did we go for seconds? Did we, did we go for seconds at all? That, that dinner sounded really, really nice. Just, just, just checking in, just inquiring. There you go. Anyway, right? Oh, Steve Barney. Absolute G. Absolute Don. He's joined the chat. Great to see you, man. Great to see you. Cool. So, now. What are we doing now? Oh, here we go. We're heading to the Impossible Choice Quiz. You know something? It was a masterful performance from Yolanda. Masterful performance. I tried to trip her up. She was having none of it. We're going to move on to one of my little pop quizzes. Okay. <laughs> a little pop quiz. Don't, look, don't be afraid. It's fine. It's fine. All right. So this one's called, this one's called the Impossible Choice Quiz. I've actually made this quite gentle, actually. It's not actually that impossible. But Good. there you go. Glad. I'll give you two alternatives. You pick one. The idea is no hesitation, right? Okay. 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 So first up, which one of these albums do you wish you would have played on, right? Revolver by the Beatles, right? Or Innovision Stevie Wonder. Innovisions. Oh, that was too quick. I tried to get I tried to get um hesitation from people. <laughs> next, next bass players. Michelle and Degicello or Esperanza Spalding? Michelle. Oh, okay. I thought you'd say that, but I thought I'm, I thought I'd remember a twist in there. Okay, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Ask another bass player that and he was like, ooh, ooh, ah, ooh. he was really, really torn. But there you go. Oh, he wow. Michelle. He picked <laughs> Michelle as well, actually. Okay. Enough, right there you go yeah, yeah. right which one of these bands um would you like to play with if you had the opportunity Foo Fighters or Red Hot Chili Peppers Chili Peppers really big time yeah of course seriously oh wow of course. I love the Foo so much I like them both but <laughs> like the Foo's man oh man I love <laughs> great okay okay you walk in the rehearsal room which one of these two drummers would you like to see sink behind the drum kit right very different, these two. Questlove or Steve Gadd? Steve Gadd. Really? There's, there's supposed to be hesitation, Yolanda. No, you're supposed man, to be I'm... taught. You're just like, no, 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 I, no, I know, no, no. I know my own mind, man. I okay, know my mind. good, good, good. good. <laughs> right. Okay, and finally, last one, last one in this segment. Last one, right? Which one of these two bass lines do you wish you came up with? Yeah? White Lines, Grandmaster Flash, or Come On, Come Over, Jacko, for stories. Come On, Come Over. You've been far too assured in this quiz. They're supposed to be station. You just like you just, you just nailed it. Like ah, nah, 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 nah. okay, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Right, that's 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 out of the way. That's out of the way. I right, failed. Right. I failed. I failed. No, no. I like the questions. They're good because I had clear answers. You could have asked me stuff, and I might not have had that. It's answer, not meant so. to be clear, so I failed. <laughs> so <it's> just, <laughs> You're supposed to be pondering, thinking, "Oh no, I don't know which one to pick." But you're like, "No, nope. oh, I see." Great. Nah, that's man. good. That's good. That's good. Mm. I can give you all the reasons why I would chose all of those as well, but never mind about that. <laughs> okay, right. There's there's one more. The one, the, the next quiz is is cut very short because, like I said okay. to you before, we'll, no, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in the, when we when okay. we get there. Right. All okay. right. All right. Cool. There you see. See, I was an abject failure in trying to trip up Yolanda, man. The impossible quiz was just nowhere. Not even close. Not even close to impossible this week. I was rubbish, man. I was rubbish. But she was amazing, as always, as always. Cousin Jeff, head of the family, I have to acknowledge your presence and your status as head of the family. Hope you're happy. Cool. Wonderful. Um, who else have I said hi to? I think I said hi to everybody. I said hi to Fish. I said hi to Jazzy Ron. Yeah, I think we're covered. I think we're covered. Right. So this next section, this next section, right, um, was a rare, sensible moment on the Monday Snack. A rare, sensible moment. I picked Yolanda's brain. I really want to get her opinion on something, right? And I really hope that my edit manages to capture what she had to say because this was very, very, what I consider to be very important. Check this out. Right, so obviously, right, you do not represent the universal views of all female musicians everywhere, right? <laughs> right. Um, Thanks. But I'm, I'm intrigued to get your opinion on something, yeah? Yes. So okay. um, 
I've had a fair number of female drum students over the years. A fair number, quite quite a number. Um, now, some of them, right, would often refer to themselves as female drummers, girl drummers, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, I mm -hmm. used to always discourage that, yeah? Uh -huh. Because I was keen for them not to be perceived as a novelty, but to be sort of judged uh -huh. on their ability, yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my aim was to encourage them to reach the point where, you know, someone shuts their eyes and it's like, the pockets, I'm feeling the pocket rather than, oh, there's girl drums, that's really, that's really unusual. Um, I'm not naive enough to ignore the fact that women in some cases, right, yeah. um, have to fight for credibility. But in your opinion, yeah, uh -huh. is my mm -hmm. approach about sort of trying to get females to f f take gender out of what they're doing in terms of I'm a drummer, I'm a bass player, I'm a keyboard player, rather than I'm a girl drummer, I'm a girl. Do you think that's helpful or do you think that's, I've got it wrong? I've always hated it, personally. It just feels like a, a, an unnecessary description, you know, because if you're not seeing the person, you're hearing them, so that's enough. And if you're seeing them, then you seeing them is enough too. But it actually is useful navigating the web, right? right. If you're trying to stand out, I would say that it's useful in the right context. I wouldn't put it in my biog. <laughs> right. But um but then I'll get things said to me like, you're the top female bass player in the UK or something like that, right? That differentiation is the you know the 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 interesting point of this of the of the sentence you know the fact that i'm female and there isn't another female that gets more work say for instance or something like that that's when you'd use the term because it's descriptive but i personally don't even like that and really what we are is just musicians so i always personally describe myself as a bass player or bassist always what does it matter if there's 10 other female bass players around or not. I don't want to be judged on my gender. I want to be judged on my bass playing, if at all, you know? It might be the first thing people see, but I don't want it to be the first thing people say, if that makes sense. You make an observation, it's a woman, right? But, man, is she happening? I can think of... I think Terry Lynn Carrington. I think of um, Annika Niles. I think of Madden Clash. You know, Madden Clash, she's bad. She's bad. Yeah. Right? Now, when I hear these guys playing, right... Mm. Am I thinking, oh, she's great for a girl? Or am I thinking, like, oh, she's bad? I'm thinking she's bad. That's what I'm yeah. thinking. I've gone from, okay, here's a little story, short one. I've come from being quite militantly against being overtly feminine on stage when I was quite young. This is before the Robbie days. Right. I wouldn't wear anything remotely alluring. I'd wear tracksuit bottoms, trainers, T-shirts that weren't tucked in, baggy, you know, nothing to accentuate accentuate the feminine curves. I wouldn't even wear makeup, nothing. Right. I was so anti being thought of as a female bass player. And um, I kind of had a few experiences where, you know, at the odd audition where it was very made very clear that they wanted me to be sexualized as a musician, which wound me up as well. Now, at 50, I'm happy to wear, if I could still get away with wearing a miniskirt, I would, you know. Right. I just did a photo shoot the other day in, in four or five inch high heels and leather boots, the whole vibe, you know, because I right, was really fun. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I see it as a powerful image of a, a very feminine woman with a traditionally a masculine instrument or something and killing it as well, not just for looks or posing. That's the thing. That's to, the thing. to me, I think it's quite powerful. So I'm actually thinking it's something to be celebrated, to be quite honest. Yeah, when you say killing it, that is yeah, that is the, the bottom line for me. It's the key. Me. It and is I the think, key. And I think mm. with you, um, you, 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 you're the first woman that I came across in sort of in real life, as it were, in person. Sure, yeah. That was lashing it. I, I guess I want it, as a man... And as a mm -hmm. musician mm -hmm. who um, has a little girl, you know, who has a daughter. Yeah. As a musician who's had all these female students, um, and I kind of care about all my students, male or female. I just want it not to. I want it to not to matter. I want. I want it to be a thing where you can't mistake the fact you're female. You're a woman. It's mm -hmm. obvious. You're a woman, right? Mm -hmm. But I just mm -hmm. want it to be. I want to walk on stage. And think, yeah, walk in the room. Look, like, oh, this girl. I think, oh, how you doing? You're right. <laughs> I want it to be that. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe I'm being too naive. Maybe that's too simplistic. I, I like the idea of celebrating what we are 
because I think that leveling things off so that it's all beige is not good. We don't we're not all the same. You know, we don't want everybody to, to be just one thing. And I think that women are under a pressure in the male world, as it were, as it kind of is, to be a little bit more like guys, which is what I tried to do at the beginning, was to downplay my femininity. I didn't want to get hit on. I didn't want to have a trouble on the bus. I didn't want anyone to fancy me on the road. Oh, okay. So I had to down, I wanted to downplay all that stuff because I didn't have enough confidence yeah. in my abilities as a player and in my um, femininity. Now, I'm as feminine as, as anyone would be in any right. circumstance. You know, I go to my GP and this woman, I think nothing's actually a woman, you know. Um, I think nothing's a fact, I, you know, I know a number of female lawyers. I think nothing mm. of it. I think nothing of it. And I think it would be great to get to that point, you were acknowledging the fact of a woman, but for the musos, regardless of what you play, mm. to, to, to kind of have the same perception. That's kind of where, where it's at. Although I've been doing this 30 plus years and I have had three kids and my youngest is just about to turn 15, so they're big. But um, I haven't, I've had support from family um, right. so that I could tour. Right. And if women, women are often caught up with the whole kind of, I'm playing my instrument, I want to do this, I kind of live, got to live like a career woman's life, can't have a family, can't, and if I do have a right. family, it's going to be difficult. Actually, you can do it, but we need support from family and close ones to help raise our children when we're not around or from within the industry alone that, you know, if there is um, a kind of ability to support women who have children to allow for that in some form to so you can get our musicianship to grace your music and we can actually raise our children in a healthy way because, um, you know, I'm a single mum and I became a single mum about eight years ago nine years ago ish and um I had to go back out on the road again and it was just like how am I going to do this so the solution was ultimately um that my daughter came on the road with me for Hans Zimmer because right. Hans offered that to me because I actually quit again if you're prepared to walk away from things they can actually come back to you in a stronger way. You just, you've got to right. have resolve. So I had resolved to put my family first mm. and not tour at that point. And I told Hans that I couldn't work on that tour. It was quite long, you see. And right. he offered um, to allow me to bring my daughter out on the road. So that's an unusual situation, although I do know other musicians who've been given that support as well. But it's one of those things where you can be thought of as a bit of a liability because you're a woman and you might have kids and responsibilities. I think that if you are really good at what you do and people really value what you do yeah. and you have a family, they will they will support you to a certain degree. Yeah. And don't let yeah. that put you off. Because I know a lot of female musicians who quit. Um, they started off, they came up with me in the early years and they've none of them are playing now. And most mostly it's because of family and children and things like that. I think we lose a lot of women in the music yeah. business in terms of instrumentalists to family responsibilities. Right, right. Mm. So thank you, Hands Squeeze as well. They let yeah. us take, yeah, we Props. can bring our kids out on the road as well. That's the boys do it as well. So it's not just yeah. me, but yeah, it's the really fab, great family environment, man. It's less rock and roll, more kind of like hanging out, going to parks and stuff like that. It's wicked. I love it, love it. Now, wasn't that a great section? Wasn't that a really, really cool section? And I hope, because we were talking for so long about this stuff, right? I really hope I managed to kind of encapsulate everything she had to say. Very, very cool. Really, really cool. Um, hi to Dave. I'll have to see I'm there. Cool, 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 cool. Right. Um, what are we doing now? All right, okay. You know what? We're up to we're up to the um the tour life pop quiz. Now this this week was a real challenge, a real challenge. Just because you know what, I'm not. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to. I explained it to to Yolanda. I'm going to let you get it firsthand. Yeah, here we go. Final bit. So this is where I need to explain this part of the show. Normally is what I call the Tour Life Pop Quiz, right? The Tour Life Pop Quiz normally exists of two or three scenarios, yeah? Okay. I come up with some really ridiculous, like, ridiculous scenarios where you have to kind of make a decision as to what you would do. Now, quite often, quite often, I've created these ridiculous scenarios yeah. using artists who you work with. 
Oh. <laughs> so I, I felt really limited. That's a couple of these names. Oh no, she's working with him. I can't say that. I can't. Oh. I can't say that. So, so this week we're limited to one. We've limited to one question rather than the usual two or three, right? Okay. And okay. I don't think. I don't think you've worked with these people. So it's just it's just tonight, and you decide basically what you do what you do in this situation. Okay. If this improbable situation was ever to occur, it's a bit bit of fun, bit of fun. Right. So okay. here we go. Here we go. Here yeah. it comes. Yeah. You've been drafted in for a gig, right? With Shakira and J Lo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's an extended version of the 2020 Super Bowl halftime performance. Right. It's going to be an utterly amazing spectacle, broadcast live across the globe. You with me? Yeah. So. The specially requested you, right? They want to have a massive bass solo feature, right? With you and the two ladies centre stage. A very daring segment. The singers appear from separate trap doors, right? In two walkways coming out of the main stage. They perform this mad, crazy dance routine. The idea is you make your way down a central walkway to meet them, right? While playing a stunning solo. There's pyrotechnics, there's laser lights. It's all kicking off. You get the idea, right? Big show, right? Yeah, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. The pre-show rehearsal runs without hitch. It's clear that your solo is the pivotal moment in the whole production. Right? <laughs> so come so come showtime, we get to your special bit, right? Right, yeah. The ladies appear, they pop up, they do the routine. Mm-hmm. You make your way towards them, you're doing your thing, you're centre stage doing your thing, the ladies are making their way back towards you. For the big ending, you notice both Shakira and Jello's trap doors are still open. They're still open, <gasps> right? But the combination of of sort of lasers and pyro means they can't see the trap doors are open, right? Yes. So even though there's padding under the stage, they're not going to get hurt. It's going to be an extremely undignified exit, right? <laughs> I want to see it now. For them Next live on worldwide TV, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. The whole segment's going to flop if you're left alone on stage that moment. You've only got time to warn one of them. So who do you decide to save from the embarrassment? <laughs> J-Lo or Shakira? I throw myself across the trap door for Shakira and I warn J-Lo. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Sorry, love. Listen, man, I was there. Mentally, guess, I was there. I, you know yes, what? Guess I would warn try- J-Lo. I'd warn J-Lo because she's older and Shakira could probably take the fall. Oh. <laughs> you see what? Right. Now, that's, that's someone that's just trying. Trying to be... Why do all the guests... The, the idea of this, right, is for guests to jettison their principles and say, right, <laughs> <laughs> you're getting crushed, I'm saving you. Oh, of course, everyone was... OK, you're, you're saving J-Lo. We are saving J-Lo. Right? Good, uh, yeah. I'm glad you played along. Yes, please forgive me, Shakira. Shakira. <laughs> so, Yolanda? Darling. We are done. It's been amazing. Thanks so yes. much for doing this, you know. You're welcome. That was really cool. It's been very really cool. I'm, I'm just like, you know, it, it's... Yeah, we went we went over, but I knew I knew we'd go over because you've mm. done so much. It's yes. I hope we get the chance right to um to do something else again because um yes. it's been wicked. It's wicked playing with you. And you... um the 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 album tra- the, the track sounds ridiculous. You played in the record, man. So hopefully hopefully we get to do some playing some non pandemic kind of real yes. time real in person playing before very long. But thanks again for oh, doing this. You that. take care. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. I don't know what's going on with my guests, right? I don't know. My guests currently, everyone's trying to wriggle out of the tour life pop quiz. Everyone's trying to massage it to their own kind of agenda. It's about abandoning principle. That's the whole point. I'm I'm gonna have a word with my future guests. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, folks. That's the end of the show. It's been really cool. Great to have you guys here. Everyone engaged with the chat. Um, really hope you enjoyed Yolanda's interview. Yolanda, you are a don. Absolute don. Absolute don. Absolutely amazing. So, um, the, the great guests continue thick and fast. Um, you've got some really, really cool next week as well. Um, so in the meantime, please do, as per usual, please visit my website, andrewsmall.net. Okay. Um, uh, you can get my first album. Um, what happens now on all the usual platforms uh, where you get your music that usual thing my social media handle is Andrew Small Drums Facebook and on Instagram it's also on YouTube where you'll be able to watch this episode in its entirety 
later on tonight after I upload it. And also all the other episodes as well. Please make sure, please make sure. It'd be great if you could subscribe. Make sure you like um, because it just helps me to, you know, it helps support the channel and helps me to do more of my usual silliness. All right. So it was really great to have you all here today. Um, hopefully see you next time. Have an amazing week. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.